thanks so much for being here with us today. Before we get started, I would like to open the space with a land acknowledgement. The RA acknowledges that we are on the traditional territory of the Attawandaran, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. The RA is situated on the Haldeman Tract, which is a land promise to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. So thank you again for being here today, um, for joining us for People Living with Dementia Share Their Wisdom. And this is actually the second of a three-part series that's being hosted by MAREP, which is the Murray Alzheimer Research and Education Program, uh, one of the programs at the RIA. So we had our first event uh, back in July, where we heard from five panelists who were living with dementia across Canada. And we had some really great discussion. Um, our panelists shared openly and honestly about their experiences of living with dementia. We had some great conversations um, a few good laughs along the way. So we're really looking forward to today's event and to hearing from um, four new panelists today. So I don't want to take up too much time since I know everyone is here to hear from them and not myself, um, but I would like to just share a little bit about MAREP for those of you who may not know about the program. MAREP is a research and education program, and the goal is to enhance well-being for individuals impacted by dementia. So of course, this includes people living with dementia, as well as care partners, healthcare providers, and community members. And there's a few key principles that we, we truly believe in at Merup. And the first is that people living with dementia must be meaningfully involved in decisions affecting their well being. That people living with dementia can continue to grow, learn, and make valuable contributions. And that understanding dementia requires learning about dementia from the perspective of people who are living with it. So we're really excited about today's event and to have the opportunity to hear from our panelists today who are living with dementia. With all that said, I think we can go ahead and get started. And I'd like to start by introducing our moderator for today, Myrna Norman. And it was Myrna who had the idea for this event. Um, you know, the idea of that, wouldn't it be great to have a panel where all the panelists were living with dementia? So we really have a chance to hear from them. Um, so we were really excited by Myrna's idea and just happy to be able to support it. For those of you who don't know Myrna, she is an incredibly passionate and active advocate living with dementia. She's been a key partner on several projects and committees here at the RIA, but also well beyond that, um, she's very involved and contributes to many different initiatives. And it just seems that like whatever she's doing, she always brings such great energy and ideas to the group. So Myrna, we're so thankful to have you here today as our moderator. Wow, it's, it's wow. Speechless, me, can you imagine that? Thank you very much, Emily. Um, I was going to read exactly what you read about Merit. I had practiced it for two days and now my my light is gone. I'm so However, sorry. <laughs> I did want to 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 let everybody know that uh, Merit really supports living the dementia journey, uh, supporting people with dementia and making certain that their voice is heard. I also want uh, you to meet Danielle Chrisman. Danielle is also RIA, um, and she also is the project manager of Canadian Dementia Learning and Resource Network. And um, it was these two ladies that I contacted to get this going. And I thank them from the bottom of my heart. I think this is the most valuable tool we have. So on with our panel. And let me introduce Carol. Carol, wave your hand so we can see you. Carol is from Shediac, New Brunswick. Yay! Canada wide, isn't that wonderful? Um, and then we have John from Alberta, from Calgary. Where are you, John? Nice there we go. Hi there. Hi, everyone. Nice to see everyone. Great to see you. Uh, Debbie Cameron, Debbie from Chilliwack, BC. Hi, everybody. And lastly it is Christine. There you are, Christine. And Christine lives in Vernon, BC. So we're a little heavy on the west coast but we tend to do things really well out here so <laughs> you can do with that what you wish we're going to get started right away i'm going to ask you all to respond to this question and introduce yourselves at the same time so we're going to start with john john how long have you been diagnosed and what type of dementia were you diagnosed with well, thank you for the question, Myrna. Um, it's been more than 10 years since I've started having trouble thinking. And so um, the, the diagnosis was, was elusive to get um, because we had to rule out a lot of other things that might have been going on. 
and that left d dementia has been kind of the, the ultimate cause. And I've been diagnosed with frontal temporal dementia. Thank you, John. What about you, Christine? Uh, I was diagnosed at 56, so almost eight years ago now. I'm just starting into the eighth year of my dementia life. Um, and I, like John, had to go through um, a lot of other testing and probably, probably before I was diagnosed, I went through almost two years of ruling out many other things before coming to my diagnosis. And I have been diagnosed with vascular dementia. Thanks, Christine. Carol, what about you? How are you doing? Um, what, what was your dementia diagnosis and how long have you been diagnosed? Uh, in 2012, I was sort of diagnosed by my doctor as having mild cognitive uh, issues, uh, but nothing specific and I never thought it would develop. Uh, things got worse and I, my pain clinic sent me to the neurologist who in 2019, two and a half years ago, uh, found frontal temporal dementia. And then in 2021, he, like he continues to do tests. He also find I have uh, early onset Alzheimer's, so it's combined. So, wow, um, are you the lucky one? <laughs> <laughs> Debbie, what about you? Um, well, I was first diagnosed about a year and a half ago. Uh, but it was a, a road. I was also, uh, I asked for a test about four years ago, maybe five, and uh, I passed the test. And so I struggled for the rest of the years, just trying to work and just live. So finally, a year and a half ago, I walked in my doctor's office and I said, I have Alzheimer's, now you have to prove it. <laughs> Oh, good for you. So he said, what makes you think it? And I said, you don't have to ask a person that is asking for a dementia test what they feel like. You know they're bad enough that they're asking. So please do the test. And within three months, I had already had an MRI diagnosis and everything. It went real quick after that. That's really good. I guess yep. just... For people's information, I was diagnosed, I think, 13 years ago with FTD. And since I've had several other diagnoses, uh, a couple, and I have uh, had new doctors because my doctors kept moving away. Um, about three months ago, I went into this one new doctor and said, it's time for me to start some sort of medication. My symptoms are getting worse. And they said, as long as you can say a sentence, you don't have the need of any medication. And I'm only sharing that to let you know that things are, are not improving as much or as fast as we need them to. Let's start with our... any medication. I'm sorry, who spoke? <laughs> Nobody, <Yeah>. all right. <laughs> what? <laughs> Let's start with John again. And John, what has helped you feel joy? while you've been on this journey. We, we, we kind of share what makes us feel horrible and undervalued, et cetera, et cetera. But what makes you feel joy? Oh, well, um, you know, that's a good question because as I've gotten older and, and as my troubles have, have progressed, the thing that comes back to me is having a happy family and also being busy. I, I enjoy being busy. I enjoy being outside. I spend a lot of time outside. And, it, and when I'm outside by myself, it's like regenerative for my, for my fuel tank. And after I'm outside for an hour or two, I, I do feel much better. And so I take particular joy in, in being with family and uh, being outside. Nature nurtures. Yes. Debbie, what about you? What brings you joy? Uh, well, definitely my family. Uh, anything and then everything with them is fine, even if we're playing wash or toss. It's just a joy to be with them. Um, my friends, 
I, when they take me places I can't go to anymore, like shopping to winners or wherever, yeah. or um, or somebody calls me just because they're thinking of me. Those things give me joy. Small things give me joy now. I get great joy. I have a patio garden on my balcony. And uh, I don't know how a person can spend hours on a balcony garden, but I can. And I love every second of it. Every second. So little things give me joy now. And I love nature. More than anything, I love nature. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much, Debbie. Carol, what about you? What brings you joy? Same thing, uh, family, nature, um, the moonrise, the moonset. Yeah. But number one is my granddaughter, my four-year-old granddaughter. It's I'm so lucky. I feel so lucky that I have her. Um, but really, less stress because being what we have is you're not attached to material things. So I love giving stuff away. I don't need stuff anymore. It's like, it's like <laughs> a, a liber, liberation of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, nature is the best, yeah. You know, I can't get over your smile and your happy attitude. Uh, when I first met you months ago, you were going through such a difficult time. And it's so wonderful to see that happiness back in your face. It Chris is. Christine, what gives you joy? Nature. <laughs> I like everybody else. I, I fight very hard living on my own to be on my own. And, and I will fight to do that till the end because the thought of being locked up in a warehouse somewhere where I have no access to outdoors and is, is beyond anything I can imagine. I still maintain driving so I drive out to the woods uh, and I know everybody thinks about getting lost and all that I don't care if I get lost if I died there I'd be happy like I'd be in my element <laughs> so being outside the fresh air the birds singing the trees the flowers I love to take pictures of nature I love to sit with my feet in a stream and the water bubbling I've created uh, my deck with lots of greenery, my house, I have my little tiny apartment, I have 23 house plants, so I'm <laughs> surrounded by greenery. It's, it, it, yeah, that, that to me is, fills my soul, and it makes me calm. Uh, I, I don't have anxiety because of that. Um, and it shuts out all that, all the noise that then all that noise that makes my brain go crazy. Wow. So universally, we all agree that nature nurtures. That's really wonderful. Now we're going to flip that on its head and we're going to talk about a negative side of dementia, which is stigma. And I'm going to just briefly say that I was on holiday and we were staying at, at a lake with some friends and our room was in the cabin, but we had to go into their home to use the biffy. The head of the household followed me in my personal space for the two days we were there. And finally I broke and I said, like, what are you doing? And I was told, you have dementia. We have to watch you. This is 2022. This should not be happening. Anyway, so let's talk about dementia. We'll start again with you, John. How do you cope? How do you respond, um, et cetera? Well, um, I, I suppose one thought that I have right away is I don't really broadcast that I have difficulties. So I think most people are surprised to find out that I do have difficulties, but I've learned how to fake it quite well over the years. And, and so I can get by in a lot of situations for short periods of time. But I do find that the stigma, it does persist with people that there's assumptions that people have about dementia. And there's, there's thoughts that they have that may not ring true. And I think that, um, you know, my thought is, is that every dementia person that I've met, every person who has dementia that I've met has a different experience. And so there's no one 
true path for people with dementia. So um, I do find stigma to be a concern and, and, um, and but I don't dwell on it at all. So I, so I, that's my thoughts on, on stigma. <laughs> oh, that's great, John. Super. Debbie, what about you? Um, there definitely is a stigma. I, um, I noticed it with my friends at first and maybe they wouldn't suggest I would be doing something because they think I can't do it anymore, things like that. Uh, the way I handled with it is I believe in total honesty and they know now how I feel when I feel it. <laughs> and uh, I think they have a better understanding like that I'm the same person. There's just days that I might love music and tomorrow I might not. So it, it just, it is what it is and just accept, accept me for who I am. And, and I find after that, it's pretty good. Good for you. Good for you. Carol, anything different in New Brunswick than in the rest of Canada with stigma? Same, same thing. Um, there needs to be awareness about young, younger people with dementia. Um, even education for doctors. Doctors don't yeah. always know, yes. Uh, yes. My, one of my doctors had the test result in her hand of this uh, spec scan, and she still made me do a paper test. She still didn't believe it. And I had another doctor who, who believed it, but it's, and my friends, I had some friends who haven't called me since because they think I'm mm -hmm. going to go straight to a, a long term, long care term, long, long term care home. Um, I had people, we, we said the grocery store and they're going to go on the other aisle to not to see us. I've seen that. Wow. But most people are okay. Most people are okay. They're, they're your real friends. That's where you see your real friends. Um, mm -hmm. My family is, has been good. So that's, that's all right. But um, also my husband, uh, we have a hard time and he can't grasp that um, something's wrong because I look okay. I seem to do a lot of things, but when he loses his patience or he uh, always gets mad, I say, if I'd have a broken foot or a broken arm, would you treat me that way? It, there's something here that's broken. You have to understand if you don't, you can't see it, but you have to understand. So Carol. something needs to be more education. Needs to yeah. be done. Thank you for sharing. That, that's painful. So I appreciate the fact that you're sharing this with all these people here. Christine, what about you? You, I know that you've had some issues of stigma. Tell us about them. Well, I've had lots of issues of it. And surprisingly enough, after working dementia care for my career um, and then being diagnosed, most of the stigma came from my circle of friends and co-workers that I worked with, I should know better, but didn't and still don't. A lot of them have fallen by the wayside because they don't believe my diagnosis because I'm not in a, in a facility yet. Um, so that's really a hard piece of stigma to try to reach people like that because they've closed themselves off from accepting that this is how it is and this is what dementia actually looks like for a lot of people um but you have to let that go i think or i have found that i have just let that go and i try not to focus on it too much i put it sort of where it needs to be that that uh, it's up to them to decide whether they can walk with me on my journey and get past their own um, outdated views of what dementia is and, and, and be willing to learn and understand. And if not, then I have to let them go because it's not healthy for me. Um, so I live a very quiet, <laughs> fairly life now mostly. <laughs> so what does that tell you? Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> but you know what? Um, we do have to change things, especially within the medical community. 
nurses, doctors, people working within hospital settings and long-term care settings. We need them to understand the difference. We, um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, I try to get on with about living. Doing what I can today is different than what I was doing yesterday, maybe. And maybe tomorrow I'll be able to do something that I didn't do today. Uh, I just try to live each day as best I can and let people sort of navigate that or not. Good. Thanks for sharing all that. Um, I I'm going to take just a minute here to, to read a poem that I think fits in well here. And it's written by Norm McDamara who is uh, the founder of a, of a group called Purple Angels um, Support Network. And uh, I'm wearing purple and I support him and I do support groups that are, that are kind of uh, because of norm. So this is his poem he wrote a couple of years ago. Today I put both coffee and tea in the same cup. Today I put toothpaste on my face instead of shaving foam. Today I thought my hankies wear a pair of socks. Today I walked out into the road and nearly got knocked down. Today I spilt my lunch on my t-shirt and ruined it. Today I had forgotten most things with, that somebody said to me within seconds. Today I had my knife and my fork in the wrong hand. Today I couldn't recognize my neighbor's name. Today I was found outside with no shoes on. Today I had to go to bed at 8.30 because I couldn't make head nor tail of the TV show I was watching. Today I have dementia. How's your day been? So many of us have been there and gone through those things. I have used many products for toothpaste that haven't been toothpaste. Um, and it's kind of, um, it's, it's embarrassing, but usually you're in the bathroom brushing your teeth by yourself, thank God. <laughs> Oh, I would like to uh, have everybody uh, meet Clara. Clara, can you wave your hand and thank you for being here. <laughs> Hi, I'm, everyone. Hi, Clara. So pleased you're here. We're Clara, here. Clara yeah. tell us what you did when you were first diagnosed. Uh-huh. Tell us what you did, the very first thing. You went in the car with Bill. And I said, I've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and I may have it, but it doesn't have me. And what did you want to have made? And I went and I had uh, a shirt made right away to what say. What did it say? And it said, I may have Alzheimer's, but it doesn't have me. Yeah. You have taught you have taught us that know you so much about resilience and about facing it head on, but not allowing it to overcome us. And I thank you for that gift. Well, you got to accept it, and make the best you can of it. Because my mother always told us, in everything bad, there's something good. You just have to look a little bit harder. Yeah. And I looked a little bit harder. I found great groups to be with people to talk to about it. So it made it a lot easier for me. Oh, I'm so glad. And I'm glad you made it today. Oh, mm -hmm. I am too. <laughs> when we started this, this um, second panel, I put a few, uh, a note on Facebook and I asked people if they could ask us questions, um, what, what would they ask us? And it was really interesting because the questions they wanted to know from us were like, how do you feel having dementia? Does it hurt having dementia? No. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'll, That's I'll... all right. Mm -mm. And the, the other question, which I thought was really amazing, was a question from a, a community uh, recreation leader. And she sent me a message and said, please ask your panel what communities can do to make prob programs more inclusive and will encourage people to come. So that's beautiful. John, you've been there, done that. So we're going to start with you. Um, 
let's start with sort of your your overall feeling towards having dementia. I think we already know, but uh, what is your overall feeling and does it hurt? Oh, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not I'm not really great with these kind of soft issues, <laughs> Myrna. That's, so, that's all right. <laughs> but um, um, I think for me that I'm just having trouble putting my thought together on this one. Um, and I have made some notes. Can you go to someone else for a minute? I can. I'll put my thoughts together, please. Most certainly. I'm going to go Great. to Christine. Oh, it doesn't hurt. Uh, it probably hurts more emotionally than physically a lot of the times. And that a lot of the time comes from the treatment and lack of resources that we are, are and have accessible to us. Um, oh, what was the second part of the question? Oh, you can't uh, ask. <laughs> yeah. um, do we have dementia? Well, maybe. Um, for me, I look to things like John, program in Calgary, UQuest, and I keep screaming to people, why don't we have that in every community? If the communities want to know what they can give us, there it is. Send your people to Calgary. See what they're doing. It's what we need. It's what we want. It will help our quality of life so much. Thanks, That's Christine. It. Debbie, I know you're ready. <laughs> um, my overall feeling about dementia, I do, I do not have any pain. Uh, I have other health issues that cause me much pain. This is not one of them, except for um, before I got on medication, I was uh, irate, uh, mean, um, hurtful to people I loved. Uh, it, it, it gives me great pain knowing I did that. Uh, but now with understanding of why I did it, I, uh, it's forgivable. So I try very hard not to get angry anymore. And I, I do pretty well with it now. Um, that was the hardest part for me because I'm not an angry person and don't hold grudges. I moved out of my, I lived in my daughter's suite uh, for 10 years and it was a beautiful suite and it was lovely to be around family and I loved it. And then I moved out, no explanation, nothing. Cause I felt nobody wanted me. It's how I felt. It's not really uh, real maybe sometimes but that's what I found the hardest about dementia. Uh, now I feel like I'm a little bit more level and uh, hopefully I stay here for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope so too. But wow, that was really powerful sharing that. And I'm so proud of you. Thank I'm you. I'm just so proud of you, Debbie. Carol. I lost a sister over it, you know. Huh? My sister and I, we used to talk on the phone every day. Yeah. And now I might hear from her once every two, three weeks because I was mean to her four yeah. years ago. Yeah. It, it, it can be, it makes your life uncomfortable sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Been there myself. Yeah. Carol, what about you? Can you repeat the question? Um, if I look it up, <laughs> overall, how, how do you think dementia makes you feel do you have physical pain uh can you live a normal whatever your normal is life okay um being frontal temporal dementia i've learned in a support group that um we have different there's different variants so people yeah. are not always the same i have a lot of uh, neurolo neurolo neuropathic pain a lot of headaches and even tickles in my brain like it's not tickles it's like something like a feeling in your brain um 
we can't take like unlike pure Alzheimer's, we can't take Ericet if you have FTD. So there's no medication. Uh, I was lucky enough that my doctor researched that the best thing we can do is stop sugar, which I did automatically. Oh, as soon as she told me, um, I did it and I'm so glad. And if I go like on vacation and I cheat and I take sugar, I really see the difference. I really, so it really helps to eat a lot of greens uh, and uh, the least sugar you can. Um, um. Carol, is there anything your community could do? Um, uh, support groups or movie nights or tea at the park? What kinds of things could your community do to help you and others like you? Um, I saw this, uh, I think this summer, this spring commercials on TV about people like uh, in the service industries being patient with people who are slow. And, you know, always, if you're kind to people, like you don't know because it's, it's in, invisible. If people can be kinder with somebody who's slow, we don't do it on purpose. And it can be another illness. That's, that goes a long way, people being yeah. kinder. I remember in the store, I was trying to find something and I couldn't find it. And I asked the lady, she told me, okay, go there. I couldn't find it. So after three times, and she really was not very nice, I just said, like, I have dementia. It's not my fault. Could you please tell me? And then she told me in a patient way, and I found it. That goes a long way. Um, I contacted my, uh, my the chapter of uh, Alzheimer's New Brunswick today, and I'm asked, I asked for more programs, and they're working on it. And I offered my services to help them because I've learned so much in the two and a half years the first year I knew nothing but by finding support groups and uh, more research and being lucky for with the uh, rare dementia Canada I uh, learned so much I said if there's something I can do and even because we're small provinces in in the Atlantic I said can we combine Nova Scotia Prince Edward Island with New Brunswick and maybe New, uh, Newfoundland and she said there might be a possibility. So I think if 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 we offer or we call contact them, maybe stuff can get moving. Look at that audience. Look at that. Carol has really been working hard at this, and she's had lots of things Thank stand you. in her way, and yet she's looking out for everybody else and trying to find something. Wow, good yes. on you woman or girl power girl power way to go <laughs> okay john it's your turn now <laughs> oh i'm still on there well my like physically feeling I, I i don't feel any troubles with dementia um i haven't had any pain or discomfort but it's probably more my feelings that are significant to me. And so I find one of them, I, I get frustrated by not being able to do things that I used to be able to do. And, um, and I get frustrated sometimes by people who don't make an effort to understand dementia. And like there's a, a doctor's office I can think about that just has not a dementia friendly atmosphere. And I've got another doctor's office where they prepare notes after my visit so I can bring notes home um, about to demit, about my appointment for my wife to see. And um, so I think frustration for me is, is my biggest challenge in dealing with dementia. Yeah, and you, you know, I, it's so valuable for the audience and the rest of us on this panel to hear you talk about that because that's a really troubling aspect of dementia. And I'm sure everybody in the audience is aware of that. Clara, you, you do really well. You've just sort of said, so what? I'm just going to live my life. <laughs> how did you come? To, how did you decide to do that? I've seen, like, my mother had Alzheimer's, but back in those days, nobody knew what to do with them or whatever. And that, so I decided when I was diagnosed, I my honestly, truthfully speaking, I said, 
you may have. I may have you, but you don't have me. <laughs> and I will not let you get me. So I decided then to get involved with the, our groups here, the, you know, ladies groups and that, because I'm not from the area, so I didn't know the people very well. But I was lucky enough to have a few friends that said, oh, yeah, come on here or there. And honestly, I don't think there's anything wrong with having Alzheimer's or dementia. I have a great time with it. I'm very proud of it. I can carry it. I And anybody that I come together with that is struggling, I've got all the time in the world to be with them because if you really accept it, because you can't do anything else about it. So you may as well make the best of it and look for the best points in it. Don't look for all the bad things because there's a lot of good people out there with Alzheimer's that are willing to talk to anybody if you just give them a chance. Wow. Just, you know? Yeah, you're amazing, Clara. Yeah, Clara. Oh, yeah right. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> Okay, now all everybody sit down because this is a tough question. Okay. Let's start with Christine. When you are unable to care for yourself, will you go to a care home? Absolutely no. <laughs> uh, I have... I have put absolutely everything into play that I can with the help of my medical team, who, who I am very fortunate in, I will say I live where I live only because I have such a great medical team and I have no other reason to be here. I'm alone here. I have no family. I have very few friends, but I will not leave my medical team. Um, because I know how important they are for me in this journey. They keep me standing. And I have worked really hard with them to put everything I could into place to make sure that I don't go into care. Okay. Carol, would you go into care uh, willingly? Okay. Um... I have to be honest, my, when my husband gets frustrated with me, he's mentioned three times that I should go to the long-term care home right now. Uh, that's when he's not in a good mood. Um, as soon as I was diagnosed, I, they, they made me think about it. And then I said, uh, I'm gonna try to live on my own as much, as long as I can. But I have a, some people have different cutoffs. My cutoff would be right now, if I need to be in diapers and if I can't go myself, I don't want anybody to do that for me. That would be my cutoff and I wish euthanasia would be available. Uh, I might change my mind when that happens, but right now that's my cutoff. Everybody's different. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Amazing answer right from your heart. Um, I, I need to re really be brief right now, but I want to share with you that I'm a member of the CCEL, which is Canadian Center for Elder Law. And so I want to say right now that we all have rights until somebody can determine completely that we don't understand. And I'm told by specialists that we can still understand while we're in that end stage. So please, if you don't know what your rights are, get a hold of the Canadian Centre for Elder Law and get some information. They have them all across Canada. Okay, John, what about you? Are you planning a long visit in a care home? <laughs> well, that's, that's a great question. You've hit so, so many wonderful questions today, Myrna. Um, my wife and I, we have not made any specific plans for, for kind of end of the journey care, but there's, I do have a couple of personal concerns, uh, that, that do worry me. One is, um, um, 
you know, my father had early onset dementia as well. And, and my parents didn't prepare very well for that. So it's important for me to be prepared. But some of the questions that have come up during my thoughts of preparing is things like MAID, the medical assistance in dying. And that's something that I've got going on in the back of my mind. I've seen people who are in end stage dementia and it's not a pretty scene. And so that's something that I'm aware of and something that I know our dementia community has been involved with the drafting of, of the medical assistance in dying. Uh, one other thing, and I don't know if I'm answering your question well, Myrna, but I'm concerned about the financial consequences of, of long-term care. Um, yep. It's certainly one of my, one of the, you know, I'm concerned about bankrupting the family, uh, you know, and what kind of strategies we can do about that. In the back of my mind, I wonder if it would protect my family if my wife and I were to get divorced, for example, yeah. and then maybe then, you know, that would help protect her more. And I don't know if that's a valid question or not, but I do have, you know, I, well, I haven't made plans for end of life care and I've I do have the legal documents like personal directive and enduring powers of attorney and all those kinds of things. But it's a question and maybe I'm just reluctant to think about more thoroughly. Yeah, I, I'm sort of sitting where you are. All those things are in the back of my head and, and I know that I need to respond to them before I am unable to. So we'll see. Debbie. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I have already made my arrangements. I am going with the MAID program. Uh, I have watched five members of my family with Alzheimer's, my mom being one of them. I, my grandmother sat in a home for 22 years, not knowing who she was. And my mother for about, I don't know, eight, eight years. I, we all want to stick around as long as we can, but what I saw was what it did to the family, what it did to my dad, uh, what it did to the healthcare system, but mostly what it did to my mom. And if I have a choice, which I do thankfully in Canada, then I'm going to pick my time and I feel good about it. I, I don't mean I feel great, I'm not having a party, but I feel at peace with being able to make that decision and knowing that I have the choice when it's my time. Wow. So that's, that's in place. I have an appointment at the end of the month to probably pick a date and we'll go from there. Huh. Me. Wow, is this ever a heavy, heavy- It sounds so somber, but I can tell you the yeah. honest God's truth. It's not. Yeah. It's the easiest decision I ever made in my life. And believe me, I've been thinking about it for 10 to 15 years. Wow. Like before I had it. Yeah. Yeah. What would oh. I do? Yeah. Amazing answers to these questions, you guys. My, my heart is just pounding with the- with the realization mm. yeah wow clara what about you do you think you'll ever go into a care home or will bill be able to look after you till the end well i wouldn't want anybody looking after me to the end thank you yeah um, I, I think it would be best i'd be in a home where there you know maybe other people there but whatever but i don't i think it would be I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to burden him with that because it's. It's just. He's a wonderful man and everything. And why should. Why should I do that? You know. Put me in a home. I'll be happy in a home. I can be happy anywhere. <laughs> but I would. It'd be hard for him to look after me if I got really bad. You know. Yeah. Or whatever. Like right now, everything's fine, but. I mean, later on, if I get, you know, too much, I think I should be in a home. Wow. And he can come and visit me if he wants, but not take care of me, like of my shampooing or showering or whatever. He doesn't need to do all that. He's paid his dues. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm not all these years we've paid our dues. <laughs> yeah. Bernard, can I just say something else about that? I think that also um, there is a lot of different sort of thoughts and elements that come into those kind of decisions for people that are living alone than for people who have care partners or families that are going to step in to ensure they receive the, the right kind of care and what they want and all of those things. So, you know, um, I'm sort of like different than Debbie, but like Debbie in the way that, you know, the MAID program is absolutely in play. And, and um, you know, I have my most program done to the highest level. If I have a heart failure tomorrow and they're not resuscitating me because I'm not going down all that those roads and, and ending up having to go into care because of the condition I come out the other side of those things. So, and I think we make those decisions sometimes based differently on our life situations. And those kinds of things should always be considered for anybody delivering care. Yeah. Couldn't agree with you more, Christine. I have a question from the audience. I think the question says, um, as someone who works in long-term care, she's acutely aware of the existing challenges and stigma associated with the move um, and the stigma. Uh, she wants to know, um, is there anything that could be done to make the care settings more appealing? <laughs> Burn them all down, start over. <laughs> <laughs> We're not fond of care homes, as you can tell. <laughs> I think that they could be made. Uh, Way to go. <laughs> five or six people in a home, maybe, and try and make it. I don't know. But uh, that's oh. a perfect answer. Go ahead, Deb. I'm not sure if it's really going to the home that's the problem. It's hard at the end of all this. When we have to go to a home, we are we can't take care of ourselves anymore. That's a hard pill to swallow. And I think that's what a home means to most people. You're gonna have somebody that tells you what to do, when to do it, how to do it. And to be honest. Well, and then take away the, what you still can do. You know, like right now, people I mean, there's really home. nice, yeah, sure. Yeah, and they might be walking and they still might make their own coffee. As soon as they get into the home, they're not allowed to do any of that. Six months yeah, later, they're in a wheelchair. That's, what I was, like, that's exactly what I was trying to say. There is no, uh, nothing set up to promote quality of life. It's like I always said, and I worked in it for my career, they should have a sign at the front door that says, you're here for your last stop. So don't expect a quality of life because that's not what you're here for. We're just going to basically keep you alive till you're dead <laughs> and, and very little in between. That's the honest truth. Okay. It's the honest truth. So that's why we don't want to go. <laughs> yeah, that's why we don't want to go. <laughs> Let's evolve the topic just for a minute. Um, I asked you when I met with you yesterday, I said I was going to ask you a question about who is your hero? Mm. Uh, you didn't have an opportunity, so I'll ask you last. But Carol, who is your hero? Oof, um, it was hard. I knew I, I, had, I used to have some and I forgot. So I asked my sister, I asked my friend, and I tried to, I was going to say my father, I was going to say my neurologist, because he's right now he's fighting an uphill battle in New Brunswick because of a mister, there's like a mysterious illness that involves yep. uh, dementia. Anyway, so he's being, he's being at, attacked by the government. But then I remember my, my friend reminded me about Terry Fox, which I'm so sad I had forgotten about. He came to my high school when, when he was on his journey, on his uh, Canada-wide journey. And I think he should be remembered. So I'm glad she reminded me about Terry Fox. <laughs> Thank you. That was beautiful. Clara, who is your hero? My mother. That was easy. <laughs> With her Alzheimer's, she's mine. 
She was very good with it. She worked to the bitter end with it. She she never hid it. She um, was very strong with it. And I think she set a, a lot of good examples for other women in our little town. So, you know, it, no, she, no, my mother is my hero. She was strong. She was very active in the Legion and she did books for this uh, company and the other company and whatever, but she was very active in the community, but it was never hidden. When she found out she had Alzheimer's, she, like myself, <laughs> I, get, yeah. I start thinking like her. She let everybody know she had it. Like, you know, it was like a winning a lottery or something. <laughs> so good for her. It was, you she know. Meant so that's where I learned to accept it, make the best of it and go on. Good. I'm going to wait with John and Debbie and Christine for a minute. We have a lady by the name of Carol in, in the audience who would like to ask a question. Carol? I think, hi, um, I can put my camera on here. Can everybody see me there? No. Nope. Uh, there, there you are. My, my question was simply going back to um, the uh, stigma of long-term care and retirement homes with memory care. And just, I guess, getting a, a feel for why the um, there's such negativity about that. I do work for Schlegel Villages in the London area. And just knowing what the Schlegels have put behind their, their care homes, um, actually is opposite to what I feel many of you think about long-term care and retirement. So I just am curious, I guess, if anyone could answer about where those feelings are coming from, if it, if it actually from experience. I know Christine said you you have worked in the, in the industry before, so you may have some experiences, or is it more of what you've heard um, from others who are living there? But that was my question. Thank you, Carol. And Christine has her hand up. So go ahead, lady. Well, I think for me, yes, I had, you know, 15 years of working in it to see. I, I watched it go from this to what it has sort of fallen into today. And I'm still very involved with it. Um, and it's really sad that at one time it was a place where people could go to and they still had a quality of life. They were still encouraged to do things as much as they could. And then it became money driven, task orientated. It became about all of the business side of things instead of the human side of things. And we watched that happen. We worked in it. Uh, also, on the other side of that, there is, yes, there is a few places popping up now that are changing that, but there's such small pockets that the majority of Canada doesn't live where there's a Schlegel village where they might be able to re receive a different level of care. There's also the dollars and cents that come into play. If you don't have that high level of income to support that, you're not going to get that kind of no. facility. So, so I think I think it's a twofold thing there. Okay, thank you. Um, before we go to another panel member to answer that, we have another question from the audience, Lynn Jackson. Lynn Jackson, a, a very dear friend. Please ask your question. Well, I don't have a question. I just want to add to the conversation in the, and tell people that I'm diagnosed with frontal temporal dementia for many years with Parkinsonism. But uh, my um, background is, was a registered nurse, so I have seen the care home situations, but very closely saw that situation with my, dealing with my dad who had Lewy body dementia. And I'm afraid to go into a care home because the people are just so overworked they don't have time to really give good care to the patients or to the well i don't like the word patient but to the residents who live there and um it, it was through a 
a, a plethora of errors, medical errors on not just the part of the doctors, nurses, dentists, care aides that my dad died, I'm, you know, he, he would still be alive. So that, that was my, that's my hesitation to go in. Thank you. Wow. Did anybody else on the panel want to respond to that concern that was raised? John, what's your, sorry, uh, Carol. John, what's your response to what's happening with long-term care and retirement communities for that matter? Well, I've heard of um, things like uh, the Dementia Village, which was originally started yeah. in, in Amsterdam. And I do believe that there's a Dementia Village now in Langley, BC, but I don't know very much about that. And the way I understand it is it's a assisted living specifically for people with dementia. And I think that, that I'm very intrigued by that idea. And I think it may very well expand across, but um, you know, I, I have a very positive thought process about dementia villages. And so I'm very interested to learn about the Schlegel village that was just mentioned. I made a note of that. And I think that there is some progress being made towards dementia friendly facilities, but, but um, you know, I've, you know, my fear of moving into assisted living is that you're then one of the first things they want to do is what I call uh, pharmaceutical therapy. And I'm pretty wary about taking pharmaceuticals for anything. And so that's, you know, I think there's maybe just a, maybe a misunderstanding of the exact process of, of assisted living, but, but, oh, you know, I, I, I don't look forward to the day where I'm just drugged up and in a chair. Yeah. The, just for your information, I'm not far from the Langley um, assisted mm. living. Um, and I can tell you it's never once been full and I can tell you it's upwards of $8,000 a month. Exactly. Right. Yeah, so you would have to go through a divorce and all kinds of things to be. Anyway, Carol, go ahead. Okay, in relation to that, in, I don't know if it's in every province, but in New Brunswick, when you're going to a long care home, you, you can sign a paper, it's called involuntary separation. So you don't have to go through a divorce. You just yeah. sign this and it's involuntary separation. So check this out if you have your, there must be in other provinces as well, because we have, don't, we don't have much here if we have that. So it, it, it it's all it across just, Canada. Okay. So that helps a lot. So it just goes on your paycheck, on your mm -hmm. income. Yeah. It doesn't affect your husband's income. So that's very helpful for people before going to long, long, <laughs> long care homes. So and that before, I, before my, my, when my husband wanted to send me, I contacted people and there, there are transition homes that when you're still able to do some things, um, there's like, I, I wouldn't help like with housework or uh, um, sometimes washing my hair, but not for everything. So there are some places, but I haven't found them, but I was told there was. Um, so, and also there, there was a good home in, in Mountain close to here, but they sold it to somebody who put the money first. So you have to be careful. It doesn't always, if they sell a good place and to some people who are unscrupulous. So it, it's hard, it's hard. So if, if, yeah, if somebody could start more stuff like that, good. Yes. Yeah. It would be worth it. Carol, speaking of that, some of us in the audience and some of us on this panel belong to this wonderful group called the Sisterhood. And the person that started that Sisterhood is Elaine Wurzma. And she is working really hard to purchase some property in her city of Thunder Bay. She has a craft fair, I think, every week. And she makes things all during the week, plus working, plus raising a family, et cetera, et cetera to earn enough money to be able to purchase this property um, that have currently homes on it, but then adapting these homes. So, you know, I don't know, I guess I'm saying that we just need to learn to, to work together for the better end of us all, and we can do it. Yeah. Uh, 
Debbie. Myrna, they're, Myrna, they're doing that in the Netherlands. They have these farm, they call them farm homes now, um, instead of the big dementia facilities. Yeah. They're on farm properties. Yeah. And um, they're wonderful. Yeah. So people with dementia live there. They contribute at whatever level. And once you go there, you can stay there right through the journey and feed the chickens or peel the potatoes or whatever it is you can do today. And yeah. they really encourage you and you can still be outside in the fresh air. Those are what we need. We need to stop building facilities facilities end up being warehouses and then you get clicks of workers and I'm sorry it happens and if you get a, a bad worker or a bully that bullies other workers then the care the, that people get end up really bad and they're the ones that suffer the price and so we need to change our whole way of thinking around that None of us, we don't live our lives in, in a housing development with 100 other people. Why do we think putting them there as we age is okay? You know, live in a family size, you know, a, a lot of elderly people might have had 12 brothers and sisters. So put people in homes that can accommodate 10 or 12 people, not 100. Yeah. Debbie, who's your hero? Oh, that one was easy. My dad. Uh, my dad was the type of guy who he was a horseman. He had dropped horses and and showed around and and uh, they belonged to a camp group and and uh, as I said before, my mom had Alzheimer's and I watched him uh, put his life on hold because he had to, uh, not because my mom couldn't go anywhere, but not where he couldn't go and leave her alone in a barn like he would have at one time. So he pulled back and that day he decided he was gonna take care of her and take care of her he did. And yes, she had to go to a home, but every day he was there by 11 in the morning. He fed her lunch. He spent the afternoon with her and fed her her supper and got her ready for bed. Every day for the whole eight years she was, she's in there. And I never heard him complain. I saw him make a few mistakes, but we all make mistakes. And um, I'm just so proud to have watched what he did with my mom. And now when I have Alzheimer's, I have to tell you, when I was really confused and when, when I was that mean person that I told you about, um, he was there for me. And we live, he lives in Nova Scotia and I live in, the, in BC. And we talk every day and he keeps me sane. And he always tells me it's okay. And he talks about my mom and the odd things she would do. And we have a little giggle about it. He always, out of everybody in my life, he makes me the most comfortable. And I'm very proud to call him my dad. Ah, Jimmy. Wow. John, who is your Hi there again. <laughs> um, you know, I've, I've been giving that some thought, Myrna, and I, and I keep coming back to, I think it's my wife who is my hero. Um, she does so much to help me have a good day. She does so much to help other people with dementia have good days. Um, she is the main reason why we have such wonderful children in our family. And so I'm very grateful and thankful that I have her in my life. And it's so important to let people know that. Yeah. Christine, who is your hero? My mother. She didn't have dementia or Alzheimer's. But she had a really hard life. You know, she came through the war and the depression and she had to 
go from flee Germany with two little kids and go to England and learn a new language and then end up in Canada. And she had many health challenges and yet she was the happiest person and the most positive person I ever met. And she always found a way to keep going and always try to make life better for other people. So is my mother, hands down. That's awesome. That's really awesome. Are there any more audience questions? We have about 15 minutes left if anybody wants to make a comment or make a suggestion. I, I want to start this off by saying, how fortunate am I to be having this opportunity to listen to these panelists who have brought me to tears a couple times today by their, their honesty and their willingness to share their soul to help the rest of us. I think it's just wonderful. I said, I just wish us would have been around when my mother had it so bad and everything. I mean, it was okay. And my sister having it on everything. But when you come here with all this group and everything, everybody, there's nobody saying, oh, she's worse than that one or she's worse, at least as far as I know. <laughs> <laughs> Debbie, don't laugh. <laughs> you know what? And I think we've all accepted it and make the best you can with it. And um, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm just so thankful to have this group to come to all the time. Thank you, Claire, and we're thankful to have you in our group. Denise, you want to ask a question? Please go ahead. Hello. I firstly thank you all for sharing your wonderful personal stories. You can't imagine how fantastic it is for Canadians to hear your story. Your words are very important for all of us. Everybody at any age in Canada, we need to hear your story. We need to understand because it, when it happens to us, we also need to have courage to be able to stand up and voice our opinions and say to our doctors and our family all of the things you guys have just described. So thank you. Um, sorry. <laughs> It's not sad tears, it's happy tears because you guys are so amazing and this is such a valuable opportunity. Uh, my question was, do you think the, the problem is with group care in general? Like what if we could design, let's say something like a dementia village or, or types of them or structures, but if they were planned by persons living with dementia with different types at different stages, at different ages, do you think then the idea of group living arrangements would be easier or would it still be distasteful? Absolutely, it would be easier. If, if they were small scale and designed with people living with dementia at the core of it to encourage them to continue doing the things that give them joy, giving them access to outdoor space, um, to do all of those things um, and to build a little community within themselves because I have to tell you my heart is so full being here today with all of these people and I will say in all honesty that one thing that gift that I received from my dementia was the people I have met on this journey have been the most incredible people and had I not received my diagnosis, I would never have met them. Our lives would have never crossed. And I know people around the globe. And I am so honored to sit with people today on this panel and on very many other projects I work with and with the researchers I work with. I am so honored and that fills my life. It's invaluable. So that's a gift from my dimension. Yeah. And I think all of us that sit on this panel or the sisterhood or flipping stigma or uh, dementia brings joy, any of the panels we sit on, and I know many of you from various panels, we have, as people with dementia, we have been given such 
an incredible responsibility and gift to share our feelings and to share what we think we know with others to help them along the journey. Yeah. <laughs> it's a totally amazing. I wanted to address um, Rose. You asked a question a long time ago about uh, advanced care planning and MAID and how they all work together. And, and I, I, my opinion is, is that we should perhaps bend Emily and Danielle's arm and, and have kind of a panel of um, experts and people with dementia to discuss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that would be better than us giving our opinions. We really need to have those that absolutely know. Emily, can you um, give your brownie? Is that a brownie thing? I don't even know. Yes, Emily says yes, we can work on that. The yeah. other thing I want you to know is that you just sometimes to get on with life, we just have to ask a question. And I've asked if we could not do this same kind of thing with caregivers. So caregivers can understand. And we can, we people with dementia can ask caregivers and help them to understand where we are on the journey. So that when I, like Debbie said, was mean for a period, I didn't like that person I was being at all, but I couldn't stop it. And, and so those that are around us need to know, Debbie, that all of that is part of the journey we're on. And we're not, that's not lasting forever. It's a small token. And so many of us have great gifts. I see Granville Johnson, who is writing a book and doing um, music to, to do a play. I see Eric McNaughton, who works so hard trying to do things to uplift people. I see Nathan. I see Susan. I see so many of you that work so hard. Valentina, you're here. Like, uh, Tom and Carol, who are, are in the support group that I support, um, are here spending their time trying to learn more. And my God, I a million dollars each wouldn't be payment enough for all you've done today. This wonderful panel of John, Debbie, Carol, Clara, and Christine. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Myrna, we have to thank you. You're doing so much. You're doing so much. You're working so hard. So we have to thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm really honored to be able to do it. We have somebody that has another question. Who was that? I saw the flicker of a hand. There she is, Wilma. I was going to actually ask you. Wilma, go ahead. You have to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I'm from Calgary. Um, I don't think I have dementia, but you never know. I don't remember everything either. Um, but I do have a uh, sight challenge. So I can feel all the same things as you guys feel in, in a different way uh, of how you get along without uh, sight. So, um, but anyway, I've been working with seniors for, for years. Absolutely love seniors. My Mother lived with us and she, she and I shared a bedroom. So I think that was my start and it just has gone from there. Um, and in Alberta, as far as I know, all of Alberta, long-term care is one, one fee all across the board. Doesn't matter whether you're a billionaire or whether you're a pauper, it's all the same price and it's, and it's a doable price. Um, wow. and, and if you can't afford that, then somehow or another it's subsidized otherwise. So, so um, that, that I've just learned that lately. I didn't realize that. We had a care facility come in. It's long-term care only. Um, and their rooms are large and they're single. There's no sharing. They're, they are working very hard. They have family consultations all the time. They, have, you, they do a Zoom thing once, once a month. Uh, with families and, and education for them, venture or whatever. Uh, I'm finding that they're, they're working hard to make differences. 
for people. I think we as family or as, as being ahead of our game, if we can say what, we're, what we hope we can do uh, when we get into a care facility, it, we can not, like this, this has been awesome today. This is what they need to hear is how you people feel and, and need, uh, what your needs are. And I have, thank goodness, I've recognized a lot of that with the people I work with, um, but not always. I mean, I've learned things today as well, but I think we need to, it's communication. It doesn't matter what we do in life. If we don't communicate uh, what's going on, we get nowhere. And the people are trying to do things, but they don't know because they aren't feeling what we feel. So we have to somehow get those, those feelings out there and, and thoughts and that what we can do. I have two ladies that I work with regularly and one is 93 now and, and she's been going downhill, but she's got aphasia as well as, as um, dementia. And I can't tell the difference at times whether she just can't think of words or whether she's actually not, but she seems on top of it. In fact, she ended up in the hospital got transferred then into long-term care after that, but she was supposed to be going into de dementia. So the health system thought, but the lady at transitions at the hospital said, she's not ready for, she doesn't fit that, the role of dementia. She fits the role of long-term care because she's got other things wrong with her. And, and so she's at a place that is old, old, old. The bad part of it is, is that the rooms are old, really only big enough for one person and they should, they, and they have two people in them. But otherwise, they have wonderful gardens that they can go out to that are locked so that they can't get out and wander away. Um, lots of tables and chairs, people can go and visit. They have an afternoon tea party that you can have your neighbor. Oh, I could go to any of the activities that she's doing. I can go with her. Uh, so they're, they're trying really hard. And I think we're learning. And it's, it's learning from people like you people that, that we learn how, what we need. Um, and the other lady, she is not have, doesn't have a bit of dementia. She is 101 in, in two week and two months, no one month. And one month from now, she will be 101. And, and she can get up and walk around. They let her. She says, I want to make my coffee in the morning. She gets up and makes an instant cup of coffee so that when she when it's time to go to breakfast, she's ready to go. And and she, herself as much as she can she goes to the washroom by herself with her walker she's all bent over that walker but she's still going and so there are places that do do give people their rights and as much as they can but they have to say what they want and some people can't say that what they want yeah and that's the that's the sad part oh and this other lady that mine that can't say what's going on now she can't get her words you can tell she you can tell her you can tell your mind going i want to say this i mean it comes to the extent she can't say what her daughter's name is and i said oh you mean jackie and she says yes like she if i can guess she's there she she's not the dementia isn't as strong as the aphasia is so i just i just really honor all you people and and i i didn't know that i should be here last time i was because I'm in Alberta and didn't read that it was Eastern Standard Time. So, so I was late on, but I really have appreciated this and I'll come back again. I might invite my daughter to uh, see what you, what you record. And she's just become a care aide and here in Alberta. And her favorite, her favorite unit is dementia. I'm oh, very no. proud. I'm very <laughs> proud of her. I'm not sure what, what it is about dementia that she likes, but I know That's she'll right. do a good job. Thank you so much, Wilma. We appreciate your comments. Jacqueline, you have your hand up. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, I just wanted to know in closing, what would the uh, panelists say if they all had to make a t-shirt? Because I loved Alma's t-shirt about, uh, it doesn't have me, I have Alzheimer's, but it doesn't have me. If you had to make a short one-liner t-shirt, what would be a quick message you would give to the public at large to get um, everyone's attention about this, these various forms of diseases in the dementia, in the dementia field. John, what would it say on your t-shirt? Well, I'm laughing first off. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, 
you know, I was, uh, my first thought is to try and work in, I have a bit of a motto that I live beside, but it wouldn't make much sense on a shirt, but I, I always try to have a good day. And right from the time I wake up, you know, I'm, I think about what I need to do to help make sure I have a good day. That doesn't really relate to dementia very easily. Um, but yet it's, that's one of the most important things to me. Perfect. I think it relates really well. Debbie, what would your t-shirt say? Debbie, what would your t-shirt oh, oh, sorry. Um, well, mine was, it's a good day to have a good day. That was mine. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, okay. it doesn't matter if you have dementia or not. That's really cool. Carol, yeah. what would your t-shirt say? I actually oh. found one at Ricky's, Ricky's, and it says, kind okay. people are my kind of people. Yeah, I, I saw that. It. Great. Yeah. And Clara, we know yours, and I would do yours. What is yours say? Mine says, uh, I may have Alzheimer's, but it doesn't have me, and it's got a happy face on it. And the other day we were out, and uh, a gentleman came over to me, and he's an elderly man, and he said, that is one of the nicest things I've ever seen, he said. And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> he said, that shirt says so much. He said, thank you, and he walked away. Wonderful, Clara. <laughs> Lynn, you I'm just, my t-shirt would say, keep on keeping on. <laughs> Great. Well, I have a t-shirt that my friends made for me, actually, because of my dementia. And it says, and I wear it all the time. And it says, underestimate me. Yeah, that'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> That's a good one. Very good. I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you in the audience for coming today and listening to us. I know you got valuable insights. I know that from an emotional point of view, you felt our feelings. Um, and I'm so honored that you came and spent that this time with us. We're having another panel on the 24th. Um, <laughs> And that will be um, on the, the same day, a Wednesday, um, and we'll be sending out information. So please tell two friends, mm -hmm. and um, and let's 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 blow this out and let's have people really understand. Thank you to my panel. Oh my God, you guys are just the best. <laughs> thank you, Myrna, and thank you, thank you, you Myrna, for oh. having this. So and thanks, Myrna, so much. Nice to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.